And welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant with you for just a little bit more of the afternoon session, joined by Katie Smith and Norman Williams. And, and we, we are in the midst of three different trials here, guys. So let me give a quick programming update. Roy Coons out of Tennessee. The jury is now officially deliberating his fate in that case. They just got the case, and we will keep you posted on their deliberations. Also in the Rosenbaum case out of Georgia, feel free to go over to lawandcrime.com and follow uh, with that case. Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum accused of killing their two-year-old foster child. Right now, though, we're in Michigan for a brand new case. Kamaya Hassel is accused of killing her husband with the help of her lover. And on the stand now is the father of the victim. This is Tyrone Hassel Jr. talking about the murder. So some emotional testimony there from the father of the victim in this case. That is Tyrone Hassel Jr. Uh, you know, he had the uh, misfortune of having this all unfold at his house. Remember that the, uh, the, the two defendants, one being tried now, and that's uh, Kamaya Hassel, they lived in Georgia, were stationed at Fort Stewart in Georgia. This happened up just off Lake Michigan in Michigan. Well, why is that? Well, Katie... You're still here? Tell me why. Why, Katie Smith, did this happen up near Lake Michigan? They didn't want to do it on the base. They obviously wanted to, to be able to deflect some attention from their misdeeds to try to get into a more civilian environment. Also, they probably wanted to get away from this strict surveillance and the strident um, investigation of the military. I was going to say, Norman Williams, also here. Thank you for joining me again, sir. Um, yeah, I, I guess if you're on a military base, I guess the assumption is that it's going to be much more tightly controlled, uh, surveilled, investigated, right? Right, and also, too, I think that the trial standards are different in the military proceeding. And also, too, there may be death penalty attached to things in the military That's side. a very good point. And, and of course, as Michigan. we know, death penalty is in play in Georgia. I don't know how the military laws might incorporate a state law or not, but certainly in Michigan, and this is an LWAP, life without parole case, there is no death penalty in Michigan. So as much as we've been hearing about the way this has been plotted and planned, I would not be surprised if they hadn't factored that into the mix as well, guys. Of course. Yeah. Let's see, we've got a new, we have a new witness coming on. Yep, let's take a look. Uh, let's go back into the Michigan court. On the stand there, Michael Schultz, a paramedic from Berrien County, and he apparently was one of the first responders, came upon the scene, found the body of uh, Tyrone Hassel III, and it looks like there's a, a, a DVD of some sort. I'm, I'm assuming it's maybe a body cam of uh, his work that night. So while they're setting that up, a quick chance to talk with uh, Norman and Katie. Norman, uh, you mentioned something earlier about the opening statements uh, sounding a little bit kind of uh, prejudicial maybe because the prosecution actually played parts of a contested confession. Yeah, it, it confused me because in New York, under the New York rules, you can't admit, you can't preview evidence to a jury without it being first admitted in evidence. I mean, you can't even talk, you can't even talk in your opening in a way that doesn't phrase each thing you say with what I expect the evidence to show. Because there's a chance that it won't get admitted. Yeah, there's a I, chance that they don't qualify. I have, a, I have a suspicion that there was some motions in limine and they hashed that out and certainly the local rules, mu rules must provide it. There was no objection to it when it unfolded. But you make a good point. Katie, let me ask you about this, because when we saw the defense attorney do his thing, there was a lot of arguing going on there Whew. and not a lot of statementizing. You know, yeah. it was it was not the evidence will show. It was just if it were me or if I saw this, I, did you find that unusual? I did. I thought it was argument and vouching. You know, he was like, trust me, like that type of idea. I know it's when I see it. And that's that's patently improper. So I think that there might be a little bit more flexibility there than I'm used to in New York. Could be quite the free-for-all that we're about to see here. Sure. Yeah, okay, apparently. we'll be back in that Michigan courtroom here when we come back after this break. This is the Law and Crime Network. We uh, literally got the tail end of that cross-examination. This witness, among other things, talked about what he found when he came upon the scene. Uh, we know that Tyrone Hassel III had uh, one gunshot wound to the head and blood pressure, uh, Norma Williams, of 60 over zero. Uh, you know, I'm no doctor, but that's pretty grave. Doesn't sound good. So then they took him to the hospital. He was pronounced dead on arrival there. So we're hearing just the basic details of, of uh, you know, what first responders found. Uh, I would expect we'll hear some medical testimony coming up. How important uh, is, the, is this for the jury at this point in the process? Um, I guess depending on how badly the body was damaged, I think it'll, it'll just go towards the prosecution more. You know, it'll take away from any chance of the jurors feeling like this was a, a mistake or an accident or any, any other defense. Yeah, I mean, Katie, this sounds like basically it's an execution, right? right? Absolutely. I think that the prosecution is just laying down the basics. This guy died. He died at the hand of 
the defendant's lover, and we're going to get to why she is responsible. Yeah, clearly not a whodunit. So let's go back in the courtroom. Obviously, a, a, an officer of some sort on the stand. Let's go. So just a kind of a practical matter here. Uh, on the stand is Brad Kotecki, Sergeant Brad Kotecki, who obviously entered the academy at age eight and is now a sergeant. Um, it, he had the body cam footage. It's on the DVD. The way the courtroom is configured, we cannot see the screen and show that to you. So we're not trying to protect you from anything. We just logistically can't see it. So we're, uh, you know, this is real, folks. This is not staged. This is not a Steven Spielberg production. We get what we get, and we're happy to do that. Uh, but in this particular case, we can't show that. So we'll chat. Uh, with me in studio, Norman Williams and Katie Smith. So uh, again, we've talked about the, the, just the process of laying out these things. Let's talk about the bigger case, though, because on its face, Norman, let me get your take on this. You, you got to wonder why we're here. We have a big confession that we know the defense is going to try and shoot holes in. Right. Uh, we know who the shooter was, not a who done it. So, what, what do you? What's the end game here for the defense? What are they trying to do? Well, I, I think sometimes defendants go to trial on what we would consider a dead case because there's no offers made by the prosecution's office, and some cases kind of demand that no plea bargain be made. And I think a case like this, the prosecutor probably spoke with, with um, <clears throat> the, the dad, Hassel Jr. And him, him and his family may have said that, look, you know, this is crazy. It shouldn't be manslaughter. They shouldn't get a break. This should be first degree murder, period. I wonder, too, and this is, you know, there's no death penalty in Michigan, so this is a life without the possibility of parole case. But, Katie, what about the aspect that, the, you know, they went to this location to carry out this crime? Local police, you know, they got enough problems, you know, with local crime and people who live there. Now we're importing people to commit murder. I mean, I have to think they, they look at that maybe more harshly. You know, you wonder. I feel like it's hard to have any sympathies for this defendant when they're going to play again and again the confession. And I understand there is some teeth that the defense has. You know, we all watched the opening and the minute he said that she had previously made statements for about an hour repeatedly denying, we're like, okay, well, there, there's some fodder there. There's some cognizable theory to take to the jury. But still, I think it's a really tough case. Norman, you mentioned how the defendant is appearing in, in court. But yes. Give me your take on that. She looks diminutive. Looks like she just kind of slunk down in her chair there. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, there was a, 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 it was purposeful that her hair was not straightened today as she looked in uh, some of the earlier photographs. But instead, she's got the little girl Afro puffs. You know, it makes her look innocent. It, 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 it makes her appear to not be someone who was capable of committing such a horrendous crime against your husband. I mean, all of these things matter. You know, it's, it, this is all part of, I hate to use the word show, but, you know, this is all a presentation for the jury, how the defendant looks, how uh, the defendant reacts, uh, and it's all going to unfold for you right here on the Long Crime Network. So stay where you are. We'll come back to that Michigan courtroom in just a couple of moments.